I've owned and used a Buki Rotor Vap in my culinary and drinks work for nearly five years now, and it's something that quickly became quite deeply integrated into my cooking. And the Rotor Vap is one of the things that I get a lot of regular questions about, so I definitely wouldn't suggest that it's for everyone, but I love mine and I thought this is a good opportunity to do an overview of the ways that I use it, the techniques that you can use it for, and something of a long-term review of my Buki R100 model. For my style of cooking, it opened up a range of possibilities and techniques that just can't be done any other way and allows me to concentrate or isolate flavours while still keeping a real intensity, clarity and freshness. So I'll go over how it works, the things I love about it, some of its downsides too, and then some more about techniques and how I work with it creatively. Let's start with a quick look at the equipment itself and how it works. The Rotovap is basically a glass distilling still, and just like a copper still, liquid is evaporated on one side and that travels as vapour over to the other side of the still where it's condensed and then collected. What's unique about the Rotovap is that the whole system can have its pressure reduced to nearly a full vacuum and in a vacuum, liquids boil at a lower temperature. So you're able to evaporate liquids and boil them at basically room temperature if you want to go as low as that. Comparatively, the little copper still that I have takes quite a lot of heat to get liquids up to the temperature that they can still at. Heat can change the flavor of ingredients and even destroy some more delicate, volatile aromatics. So, Having the opportunity to work at lower temperatures gives us this ability to preserve delicate, fresh flavours. And it's fundamentally this that makes this such a magical piece of equipment to me. To more fully understand the Rotovap, you need to understand that really this is a system made up of three parts, and you need all three working together in order to do the sort of low temperature work that I use it for. So of course there is the Rotovap itself, the glass still with a flask that is lowered down into a temperature controlled bath. And for my low temperature work, I'm usually running that water bath at about 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. This flask can be rotated in the water bath as well, which gives you a larger surface area to any liquid that's within it, and that gives you more efficient and rapid evaporation of it. So if you're distilling, this means you can more quickly distill your liquid, or if you're concentrating a flavor by evaporating off water, again, you can do this much more rapidly and efficiently. The liquid that's evaporated from that flask travels up through the Rotovap to the other side where it condenses on these chilled coils. Normally I have my condensing coils chilled down to minus 10 degrees Celsius and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The liquid that condenses on these coils then drops down into the receiving flask where it's collected. Now, for the most efficient distillation possible, there needs to be a difference of 40 degrees Celsius between the temperature of the water bath and the condensing coils. So if I only want to heat my liquid up to 30 degrees Celsius as a maximum in the main flask, then those condensing coils have to be chilled right down to minus 10 degrees Celsius to give us our 40 degree difference. And keeping that low temperature in those coils requires the next part of our Rotovap system, the recirculating chiller. The recirculating chiller constantly pumps a chilled liquid through those condensing coils. The kind of cool looking blue liquid within those coils is ethylene glycol, which can be chilled down to minus 10 degrees whilst remaining a liquid. The last part of the system is the vacuum pump which allows us to drop the pressure within the Rotovap and use it at low pressures and therefore low temperatures. To do basically everything I'm going to talk about in this video, you need all three parts of the Rotovap system all working together. And ultimately, that's the main problem most people might have with the Rotovap system when I come to the downsides, because to have all the parts for this is both very expensive and takes up a lot of space. But I've got a lot of possibilities and techniques that I want to cover before we come to those pros and cons, so I'll start off by talking to you about the main ways that I use this equipment. 
So basically there are two broad categories my uses fall into. Low temperature distillation and isolating flavours and concentrating and intensifying flavours at low temperature. So let's start with alcohol distillation as the most conventional food and drink application for the Rayovat. I'll just quickly note here that technically you need a rectifiers license to do the sort of distillation that I'm going to talk about here. I got mine a few years ago but you should check what the rules are in your local area. So I use the Rotovap to distill various alcoholic and non-alcoholic mixtures for culinary use and to make my own gin as well. The vacuum distilled gin that I make I serve at the very start of my dinners for a G&T with fully homemade gin and homemade tonic. I've got a video where I show you all the stages of how I make this gin, but essentially I distill each of my botanicals individually, and that way I can distill them at the concentration and temperature that suits it best. So for example, my juniper, I actually distill at a slightly higher temperature of 55 degrees because I find that that helps to bring out some of its piney flavors, but then the citrus and herbs that I'm using, I'm distilling at much lower temperatures to really preserve their freshness and vibrancy. I can very precisely control these distillations and then blend them to give me my finished gin. So what I get is a gin with really beautiful, delicate, fresh flavours, but also a method that's extremely precise and consistent. I also use the Rotovap to make some other alcohol-based distillations that then I use in some dishes on the tasting menu. There's a spiceless Scotch bonnet distillation that I make that's a good example of this, where I vacuum distill Scotch bonnet chilies, and that lets me capture the delicate freshness of their aromatics and, and not damage or change those flavors with heat, but also capsation that makes the chilies spicy is too heavy of a molecule to distill. So you end up with this edible perfume of Scotch bonnet chilies that has the freshness and intensity Density of their fresh flavour, but without any heat or spiciness to it. Then I use that Scotch Bonnet chilli distillation to flavour little chocolate truffles that I make and serve right at the end of the tasting menu between sheets of fermented passion fruit glass. And again, I've done a whole video about that specific dish and technique, so I'll make sure that there's a link to that video down in the description. Then the last thing that I'll mention on the distillation front is that you don't always need to be distilling with alcohol. Although alcohol is particularly brilliant at capturing and holding on to flavours, you can also make water-based distillations. If you think of something like rose water, that's essentially the idea and you can make products like that using all sorts of different herbs and teas and flowers and get all the benefits of vacuum distillation, meaning that you can make these at low temperatures and again really preserve their delicate flavours. These are called hydrosols and they can be really useful because sometimes I want to add a flavour to a dish or part of how I'm cooking but I don't necessarily want to take other characteristics of that ingredient. So if it's a tea, perhaps it has tannins or bitterness, but I just want the aromatics from that. And I also don't necessarily want to add alcohol to that recipe. It, it might not fit with what I'm doing. So a water-based distillation like these hydrosols can be a great, very effective way of managing this. I use the hydrosols that I make in the Rotovap in various ways, sometimes adding them directly into recipes and ingredients, or sometimes using them for things like marinades. There's a distilled osmanthus flower hydrosol that I use, for example, to add aroma to a blue algae miso sauce that I have for one of the dishes on the tasting menu, which is quite a complex dish, but this is the perfect way to add this beautiful floral aroma to it. It's a very powerful technique that gives you the ability to add flavors in new ways into food and drinks. And even things as simple as cold brewed dashies can really benefit from this. Next up, let's look at using the Rotovap to concentrate flavors. You can think of this as sort of the other side of the coin to distillation. When I'm distilling, I want to evaporate a liquid and then I want to condense, collect, and use that as my finished product. With the low temperature flavor concentration that I'm doing in the Rotovap, I want to take a flavorful liquid and then I want to evaporate water out of that, thereby concentrating and intensifying my flavorful liquid. 
here the water that's evaporated away is just a byproduct and it's the concentrated ingredient that I'm focused on. Essentially, this is just like making a reduction in a pan on the stovetop, except again, here I get to do this at very low temperature and have all the benefits that come with that of preserving delicate, fresh flavours. So this is particularly effective when you think of making something like this blood orange reduction, which is hugely concentrated and intensified, but still has the freshness and the vibrancy of fresh blood orange. This is a really magical thing to be able to do. Suddenly you can turn the volume up on flavours and use ingredients in just a whole new way. I can take something like rhubarb, juice it and then clarify that juice and then low temperature reduce and intensify that flavour to make a sweet and sour concentrated rhubarb sauce that I serve with the rose kochi halloumi dish on my menu. Really, any fresh flavour that you want to concentrate but wouldn't want to damage or change with heat, this is amazing for. I often do actually keep the water that's produced as a byproduct from this too, because a bit like the hydrosols I talked about before, this liquid contains some aromas from the original ingredient. So it's a good idea to store it and then you can use it in other ingredients and preparations. And related to this, I've also made what I've called compound honeys in the Rotovat. Here I take honey from my own bees and combine that with an aromatic infusion, and then use the Rotovap to concentrate that honey back down to its 18% natural water content. And this gives you a way that you can add flavours into honey that might not normally easily infuse into it, but still end up with a shelf stable 18% water content honey. And we can even start layering up techniques here. So for instance, I could make a hydrosol of black pepper, add that black pepper hydrosol into honey, and then use the Rotovap to reduce that mixture back to 18%. And there I've made a compounded black pepper honey. You can also use the Rotovap to make modern tamari analogues inspired by Noma's method, where they blend a miso with a liquid, clarify that, and then reduce it down to concentrate it to a flavorful tamari. Again, being able to do this at low temperature just means you're preserving more delicate aromatics and freshness of flavor. I've made a masa corn miso tamari this way, which is really delicious and sweet and salty and a gooseberry and roasted yeast miso tamari as well, which is really delicious and is something I'm working with at the moment. The last thing that I'll mention here before I go into the pros and cons is that you can also use the Rotovap to remove alcohol from things. So here essentially you're distilling, but you're treating the alcohol as the byproduct. You might want to do that sometimes if you want to reduce the alcohol content of something because say you're using it in a frozen dessert and it's depressing the freezing temperature too much, or there could be various instances where you want the flavor from something, but you don't want its natural alcohol content. I might want the flavours of a stout, for example, to pair against a cheese, but perhaps not its alcohol content. So the Rotovap would give me a way of doing this at low temperature so that I preserve the flavours in the stout, but I can have it without its natural alcohol. So let's finish up by looking at some of the pros and cons of the Rotovap. Really, the pros come down to the ability to use the techniques that I've been talking about and to preserve delicate flavours at low temperature. Along with that, because I've got the combination of precise temperature control and pressure control, it makes these techniques extremely reliable and consistent for me, which is really important for someone like myself who's working on their own and has limited time and resources. Ultimately, the Rotovap lets me do some things that just can't be done the same any other way and work with ingredients in new ways, or in fact, with some ingredients that we wouldn't even normally think of as food. And I might at some point do a whole video just on that because it's kind of its own interesting topic. But this style of working wouldn't suit everyone and your type of food or distilling just might not need or really benefit from this type of equipment. It's fairly niche, and whilst I think it's brilliant, it comes at a cost that wouldn't be necessary or justifiable for most people. And if you're thinking about getting one, you should probably be really clear about what you want it for and whether you need it. 
it's also worth saying this isn't a replacement for traditional techniques and other delicious ways of making food and drinks. I'm covering this here because I get a lot of questions about it, but there's also tons and tons of relatively simple and traditional techniques that I use on my menu. And really it's all about what gives you the flavor that you are looking for. So while I love my Rotovap and I don't like to concentrate on the negatives, let's just skim over some cons to the equipment before we finish up the video. The biggest thing here has got to be the expense. There's just no way of getting around the fact that this is a really expensive piece of equipment. You do have to be aware that you can't just have the Rotovap in isolation. You do need the chiller and vacuum pump and controller along with that. And to get all of those together along with the VAT, it's going to cost about £7,000 to get set up with just the base level Buki Rotovap like the one I have. And I wish that I could have actually gone for the Model 1 up from this, but I could only get mine at all because of a one-off consulting gig that I did. And then there's the physical space that the system needs to consider. It's got a big footprint that could be a real challenge for any kitchen or bar that's a bit short on space. I actually have to keep mine in the dining space where my guests sit because there just isn't room for it in my kitchen. And I actually quite like that. I think it makes for an interesting talking point and it means that the guests can see it if I refer to its use. But this is definitely something you would have to consider if you're thinking about whether or not you have the room to, to work with one of these. And this is definitely not something you would want to be moving about regularly. Whilst it is made from toughened glass, it is still glass and it is still breakable. That would be another thing that you might need to consider if you were going to introduce one of these into a busy environment, which of course kitchens and bars can be. I'm working on my own here, so it's hardly a hectic environment, but I've still broken one of these big glass flasks before, which is really gutting and expensive to replace. The system can also be awkward to clean because it's delicate, so taking this apart and cleaning it can be quite painstaking, and that's not something I would want anyone else but myself doing with this. So to sum up, I would say, of course, this isn't going to be practical for a lot of people in a lot of ways. And there is quite a big learning curve on how to use it and then how to use these techniques within your, your food or your drinks and your cuisine. Most of the ways that I use mine are actually fairly subtle and aren't typically things that I mention to the guests. But I do really love mine and it's woven through my approach to cooking at this point and at times it feels like the closest thing to magic in food and drink. If you'd like to see more about how I use mine, I'll put a link to some of the technique videos I mentioned in the description, including how I make my gin, how I make that scotch bonnet distillation and dessert and how I concentrate flavours for things like the rhubarb molasses that I make. Thanks for watching, I hope it's been interesting and useful and I'll see you soon.